David, can you introduce yourself and tell us what you do? My name is David Pickup. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I have uh, two practices, private practices, one, my main one in Dallas, Texas, and my secondary in the Los Angeles, California area. What motivates you to work therapeutically in this area? There are so many men from, in my case, about 10 to 29, uh, some older, but this age group, I have noticed are coming to me much more fast now and are very confused in gender and sexuality issues and they're hurting. There are often men of faith who this involves faith matters and they're confused, uh, sad, angry, feel stuck in terms of their gender identity and sexuality. And to be able to help them actually have deep healing experiences that get down to the root causes of homosexual issues that results in a spontaneous lessening or dissipation of homosexual feelings and a and the rise of the authentic secure self-esteemed self is a pure joy for me so that's why i do this because of such a great problem that is is so after a period of time beautifully worked out so what is it that flips what is it that comes together or aligns to bring about this dramatic change by the sound of it. Even though there's a lot of emotional uh, manifestations and s uh, several underpinnings of emotional wounds, what you're asking about is a, a moment of change, which is a great question because a lot of people think that, well, change is just nowhere near possible in any, in any way. But in my office, I see firsthand men, uh, let's say their homosexual feelings are based on a severe case of gender identity inferiority and they project that need outward and are uh, only seeing the beauty and wholeness of maleness in another man's body that becomes eroticized. When that shame-based statement about them that at first says they're worthless as men uh, are uh, there, there's, they're stuck and they will always be stuck, they're worthless, that kind of, those messages. When those messages are relieved, the moment of grief and anger that's authentic, that they've never faced before, that's underneath those homosexual feelings, when that's wiped out of the way over a period of time, there are actually moments in my office where that change automatically happens because we're dealing and feeling with what's really going on underneath the homosexual attractions. And so when they come up out of that grief process, the moment of change happens because when they return to who or what they've been erotically attracted to before, they, they look at and they have a cathartic experience of, of some level, of some type. And, and they say things like, oh, wow, David, I just had one last week. Uh, said to me, this whole, I'm paraphrasing, but this whole whole manhood thing, this feels a lot better than sex with men. That's an unsolicited, those are unsolicited responses. So those are moments of actual emotional change, not just behavioral change. And let's face it, sexual pleasure is a pretty heavy duty kind of pleasure. And something, I know two things when these men spontaneously describe these uh, cathartic moments of change. First of all, for them, it, it isn't inborn, these issues, and it's changeable. Is that about the therapeutic process, or, or is it about the relationship with the therapist? What, what is it that is triggering this catharsis? It's, it's, it's about both the relationship with the therapist and the therapy itself. In terms of clinical speak, the therapy in the kind of therapy I do, which is authentic reparative therapy, large R, uh, reparative therapy through psychodynamic processes gets down to where these wounds actually originated that are being repressed in the body and, and mind and, and emotions and releases that because of the nature of the psychodynamic processes. But this probably won't happen very easily or at all if it first and foremost is not based on a very compassionate trusted relationship in which the, uh, the, the trust and the transference between a client and therapist 
it, it, this kind of thing won't happen if that is not really set up in the beginning for a, a wonderful relationship. So they're, they're both necessary. Is it always trauma? In my experience, I've never seen a client who has not had some level of some type of trauma, including the kind of trauma that's very hard to pin down sometimes, which is, a, which is neglect type of trauma. In America, neglect is definitely considered professionally as a definite form of, of trauma. Uh, it may come in the form in some cases where, let's say a boy is just, and I know of at least one case, where a boy was simply never touched uh, at all favorably by any of his male role models. Uh, that's neglect and it can be, uh, it can develop a voracious appetite for physical affection that is possible at least to get sexualized later on in puberty. So that in itself is, is trauma. It, it, it sometimes is a little, feels a little uh, deceptive uh, or hard to pin down uh, and it makes people wonder, well, where's the trauma? But Every time, the body never lies. And when we do these emotional processes, I don't force people to feel anything. This stuff automatically comes up, which is either neglect or, or overt uh, trauma of some type, whether it's uh, beating or shaming incidences or actual sexual abuse, for instance. As I listen to you, one would not think that anybody could have any objections to what you're doing. And yet this is controversial. Why is that the case? It's controversial, in my opinion, because the theory of this therapy questions the validity of the foundation of gay ideology, which is, to be succinct, I was born naturally this way. Reparative therapy is for those people who know that, at least for them, these homosexual feelings were not caused by some genetic marker or, or there is no gay gene, for instance, but they are based on emotional wounds, gender shame and unmet emotional needs to be succinct. And so for me to suggest that, it contradicts the foundation stone of what gay ideology says and so therefore is, is felt as threatening or perceived to be threatening to the very personhood of, of people who believe the opposite. And would there be clients who come and begin working and who say that this is not for me and uh, would go in another direction? What, what's your reaction to that? Yes, and my reaction both personally and professionally, even in terms of ethics, is to uh, wish them well and to not coerce them and to... Um, an example of that would be, I have gay clients. Some people are shocked about that. I don't put them down. I don't say, hey, you, you should change. Uh, if they ask me about what I do, uh, or ev I should say, everybody knows what I do, but I think it's a testament to the trust between therapist and client when I say that even though some of these gay guys know what I do, they're not interested in changing, and, and yet our, our trusting relationship is, is uh, trusting enough and that I help them in so many other areas, and we have good relationships. So if someone comes to me, especially if it's a, a minor child, uh, you know, I, I don't, I handle it by uh, actually in some cases, uh, just recently, I've, I've refused uh, to treat someone or, or bring about these concepts or processes if they have no interest in, in, in changing at all or even believing in what I believe. I, I, in effect, I may not affirm what their beliefs are at all, but I certainly leave room for them to uh, believe what they feel fulfills them. So it's not always um, faith-based, the work that you do? It's not always faith-based, but it's almost always faith-based. But even in uh, faith-based uh, clients, if someone wants to come and I can either, if they're a minor and uh, I feel they're being coerced, refuse to do that, but even if they're an adult, and I'm sensing that they really don't want to do this work, I'll be in a supportive way, I believe, challenging them to ethically get across the fact that nothing's going to work. Whatever therapy for any issue is never going to work if someone's not truly motivated. So I, I always keep a, an ear out to, to try to assess for motivation. I've heard you refer to your work as authentic reparative therapy. Does that mean that um, there are other types of 
reparative therapy uh, that don't work or are inauthentic. How does what you do fit into mainstream psychotherapy? Uh, what I do fits into mainstream psychotherapy in some basic ways. Even though the processes are used for goals that many members of our profession would not want to do, the fact is that I do, in fact, psychodynamic and some cognitive behavioral therapy which resolves these issues of sexuality and gender issues. Uh, these, are, these processes are based on time-honored, approved, well-thought-of, well-respected psychodynamic or cognitive behavioral techniques that, have, that are shown to be effective for a lot of the population for uh, the last almost 100 years. So uh, the other kind of therapies that don't pay attention to the shame as expertly, I might say, uh, may not be as effective because they're not really dealing deeply or resolutely enough with the, the wounds I've mentioned earlier. Uh, or then there's the other uh, kinds of what people call counseling or therapy that may actually not be done by licensed trained individuals and we have to be really careful about that because uh, if someone, and it's an ethical principle here in America, uh, if someone is not trained well in what they say they're doing, that's unethical in this country. So it, it's an important issue. I'm glad you raised that. Your own journey, David, can you say something about uh, the path where you've taken as a man growing and maturing? Yes, uh, my story is pretty long actually, so I'll make a, a long story relatively short. Uh, I was one of those five-year-old boys who was sexually abused by a, a pedophile many years ago. It wasn't violent, but it was still, it was still abuse, I assure you. And so that, plus not getting a lot of male affirmation or male affection and approval, those things, that combined together uh, to uh, result in homosexual feelings when I reached puberty, uh, at somewhat later in the teenage years. And so uh, I was also, if I may say, the poster child for repression. And so being kind of a faith-based, uh, not kind of, definitely a faith-based uh, boy and young man, I, out of a sense of shame, repressed all of that stuff. And it didn't go anywhere, it just came up later. And so, long story short, I had some experiences uh, in which I, I knew sexually they didn't, they didn't fit my faith, nor who I believed I was, which was born heterosexual. And so then I finally found an authentic reparative therapist uh, years later as an adult and spent many years going through those very same deep emotional processes I've just described earlier and it really worked for me plus my own work in my own courage to seek out healthy male relationships that really touched me and filled some of those needs and really did a lot of healing in my personal life not just the therapeutic office which is the goal in my opinion of all therapy and it resulted in a it resulted in a, the rise of my authentic self and my feelings, not just in my head knowledge, but my feelings of secure male gender. Uh, and my feelings began to, to uh, lessen and dissipate and change. My feelings for women uh, automatically began to, to develop. And I'm, I'm one of those, not that other levels of change are not very important and very worthy, but I'm one of those cases where these feelings, because I, I did the emotional work, I hung in there and I, and I did it. A homosexual, I just don't have homosexual feelings anymore. I can't even remember the last time I w was actually aroused by uh, some guy or some picture or whatever. Uh, if I feel them maybe beginning, maybe I guess to come up a little bit, I, I've done so much work, I know myself so well that it's the, it's the wounds that come up first. Uh, for instance, I can remember being shamed as a little boy and feeling maybe separate or isolated or, or uh, different in a shame-based way than other, other guys. And when I remember the emotional work I did and uh, get ba back into, and I'm, I'm talking about a period of time that's now microseconds, by the way, because I've done so much work in the past. When I 
when my body remembers automatically that resolution uh, and and feel this authentic thing coming up in me, if any feeling was going to come up, it just it, it just doesn't. It just doesn't because I'm as a result of all the the work I've done. In your goal to be helpful to other people and to uh, get a good um, understanding across to people who don't understand. Have you ever felt silenced? I've felt silenced before therapy or after? As a, a clinician or as a person? I, either and both. Okay. Primarily, probably as a, as a therapist, as somebody okay. working in this domain. As a clinician, uh, I've absolutely felt silenced and have pushed back in ethical and very, what I might say, bold ways. I'm now a national lobbyist in America that seeks to educate legislators in as many states as possible, which we've, we and my team have been doing this for the past three years, because there's all kinds of dangerous government laws that all say the same thing, that this kind of therapy should be outlawed, lose our licenses for, or maybe even be prosecuted for conducting this kind of therapy. And my voice has been, it's been attempted to, in some cases through laws actually accomplished, such as in California where they have a law that is now actually a therapy ban for children. Uh, so yes, my voice has been silenced. And yet, uh, I'm doing something about it. I've chosen to do that. And uh, like I said, I, I'm a national lobbyist to prevent or take down these laws that are really harming a lot of children who need and want these, these therapies. So what's your understanding of why this is happening, this silencing and this, this close down? The, the shutting down of ideas is an old, old trick. Uh, sometimes it's conscious. Sometimes it's unconscious. Uh, in my experience, the vociferousness of the gay activism in this country is so treacherous that they're actually trying to shut down ideas. Well, that's not even an American concept. In America, we're free to express free speech, ideas. So I'm all for a gay person having the right to express themselves. But when it comes down to giving me rights to express myself therapeutically or personally on these issues, they will actually attempt through laws or through uh, demeaning language in public, online, or what have you, they'll seek to shut actually the, our voices down, my voice down. So uh, that's happening in California where I'm licensed, and that's happening in other states where I'm not licensed. So far in Texas, we, we still retain those great freedoms to have a voice. Tell me about the Human Rights Committee that I know you've been involved in at the UN. The Human Rights, there, I, I believe there's several committees, but if we're going to talk about them in mass for a minute, because they're trying to do the same basic thing. The Human Rights Committees in the UN, some of them, are trying to, same thing in the United States, demean, provoke, tear down people who do authentic change therapies. They do this not by appealing to science, even though in the verbiage they'll appeal to science, but when you look at the science, the science is not real valid research, or they are cherry picking things out of, out of the research that they want to hear. And so these committees are trying to uh, cut our rights worldwide make recommendations that all these therapies should be banned and found to be illegal and people eventually, uh, in my opinion, to be prosecu prosecuted for such. And then just yesterday, another committee from the UN, who's had input by a lot of American gay organizations, gay activist organizations, has brought about a new statement saying that Men who have sex with men have essential rights, which includes 10-year-old boys to have sex with men. So the world through the UN is beginning its slow march towards pedophilia. And my question is to America and the world, are we going to let this same thing throughout history occur in the modern age?
Rome, ancient Rome, comes to mind. Are we really going to let pederasty or some form of that exist in the world today? Because that's where some of our professional committees and organizations are trying to make us move towards. Would you define change? What do you mean by change? Change can mean several different things. And I think we all should be proud of that. A lot of people think in error that we're talking about somebody flips a light switch and you go from completely and always gay to completely and always heterosexual in terms of just feeling. But a moment ago you spoke about cathartic moments that take place in your office. So put that into context about right. what you're saying now about change. So the cathartic moments of change happen in the office and more and more both in amount and in deepness of fulfilling traits in a, in a man, we'll say, because we're dealing and feeling with the actual wounds that are causing the homosexual feelings. And so over a period of time, sexuality that most clinicians, except on some level nowadays, is actually on a continuum. That's the point. So nobody who's a, a good therapist is going to say, oh, it's, it's like a light switch and a miracle, a magic pill. It's not what we're talking about when we're talking about change. We're talking about a process of events that happens, I'm being generic, but mainly over a year or two, and in some cases, like my case, many years. Uh, it takes people that long sometimes to really affect change because their wounds have been so deep. But this is the same kind of thing that you would say, uh, let's say we were dealing, even though homosexuality I don't believe is a mental illness, let's say you were dealing actually with a depressed client. Would you say change hasn't uh, been possible or, or real or of value if he was, uh, if it took him a year to just get, have a 50% reduction in depressive qualities? No, you wouldn't say that. You would congratulate him. You would further that change. You would, you would run alongside him uh, to embolden him to, to continue on that if he's motivated to do so. It's the same thing in terms of change with reparative therapy.